Yeah, uh, we have seen until now the mechanical devices for measuring force or weight. They are normally meant for um, a smaller range, few kilogram or uh, for example, compound uh, lever mechanism that is uh, our uh, platform balance, probably it may be one or two or three tons. Suppose 100 sub tons if you want to measure, naturally people go for hydraulic or pneumatic load cells. Hydraulic is for uh, still higher range, medium range is pneumatic load cells. Uh, how a hydraulic load cell and pneumatic load cells are, are functioning, we are going to see one or two principles. Uh, first, uh, the hydraulic load cell, there, uh, there is a diaphragm. On the diaphragm, the load button, the load button sits there. And uh, below the diaphragm, we have got a um, uh, liquid, incompressible liquid, and which is connected to a pressure gauge. And you have got the chamber, yeah, suitable chamber at the bottom, so that when the force F acts on the load button, the uh, liquid below the uh, diaphragm gets compressed because of the deformation of the diaphragm. So, for a particular force, a pressure is developed in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the liquid and that is being read by a pressure gauge, probably it may be a Bowdoin type pressure gauge and uh, that reading, pressure reading is calibrated in terms of hundreds of, new, hundreds of newtons or few tons in terms of tons. Uh, how do we ensure that, uh, yeah, the working principle, we can see this signal flow diagram, block diagram, diaphragm plus oil converts this force into pressure, yeah, diaphragm plus oil, force is converted into pressure. This pressure is read in the pressure gauge and you have got the output signal in as in the form of uh, a mo mo motion of a pointer over the scale. So, that is our XO. So, how to ensure the moment you apply a force, it is converted into pressure, for that is achieved by having a um, initial pressure, we have got initial, initial pressure of say uh, 1 or 2 bar uh, is there, uh, it is of the order of 0.2 bar, yeah? I mean 2 bar, 2 bar pressure, 2 times atmosphere yeah? or 0.2 Newton per millimeter square, a 2 bar pressure is built in, that is our initial pressure. So, the pressure gauge may read a 2 bar or some pressure that is written as 0, uh, uh, zero uh, input signal, so that's 0 force, that is will be 2, 0, 4. Further increase can be only from the uh, applied force. So, that is a compact unit made up of uh, hydraulic elements. Next, uh, we should see the pneumatic load cell. In the pneumatic load cell, we have the principle uh, nozzle, uh, I mean flapper nozzle principle, that is it's, uh, it, it, this constitutes a flapper nozzle principle. Uh, is made use of in, uh, in the uh, pneumatic load cell. It is because the air, compressed air is, uh, uh, can be compressed. Yeah, it is a uh, compressible medium, whereas liquid is incompressible. So, this is simple setup, whereas with uh, pneumatic air or any gas, uh, since the, the fluid is compressible, we are using the uh, flapper nozzle principle. So, so, this is the flapper nozzle principle. It is written there, for, uh, uh, fixed nozzle, no. Uh, flapper, flapper nozzle principle. So, that is being explained before we go to that load cell. See, here we have a fixed nozzle and variable nozzle in the form of the, in, uh, in the form of your imaginary cylinder extended, the, this nozzle being extended in this gap that is the variable nozzle and the in between these two fixed nozzles, we have the pressure gauge. Uh, that is a chamber pressure is measured by a pressure gauge. Now, the distance between the uh, uh, end nozzle and the flapper, this is a flapper which can rotate or move, varying the distance in front of that uh, tip uh, nozzle. And the chamber pressure in between these two uh, fixed nozzle, we have got supply pressure, it is of the order of 1.2 bar. So, sometime, I mean this is usual pressure for the flapper nozzle system. Uh, a yeah, gas or air, compressed air at 1.2 bar is the supply for this whole instrumentation. So, as x varies, the P o varies as per this curve. Yeah? When x is, is equal to 0, P o is P s, P o, P o is P s when x is 0. That is when the flapper fully closes, then this pressure becomes the supply pressure. For any other distance x, uh, then it varies more or less you have got some range as linear range uh, in this instrumentation. Anyhow, this is principle. By giving a displacement x, we convert that displacement into a pressure by, by the flapper nozzle principle. That is what is being made use of in this uh, 
pneumatic load cell. We have got fixed nozzle similar to that fixed nozzles and variable nozzle between the extended extension rod and the bottom uh, bottom wall we have this variable uh, area. Now, how what is this variable area pi d if d is the diameter of this nozzle tipped nozzle d is the diameter of the tipped nozzle pi d x is the uh, cylinder uh, imaginary cylinder from the tip of the nozzle to the flapper that is pi d x is the area and uh, that uh, x will have uh, effect on this uh, pressure p o until this uh, from uh, the cylindrical area becomes equal to the cross sectional area of this hole that is pi if that is the maximum that you call if it is x maximum that is equal to pi d square over 4 until this cylinder surface area equal to this cross section area of the nozzle you will have the effect of x on p o later on you will not have that is both the area are equal now you find d pi d that cancels out then you will find x maximum is equal to d by 4 that is the maximum distance one can have yeah so the such a distance is uh, given to this extension rod by the diaphragm when the diaphragm is acted upon by a force f so the force f see the diaphragm uh, this uh, block diagram or signal flow diagram force given to the diaphragm it then diaphragm gets deformed this deformation is carried to this nozzle to this uh, 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 to this opening by this extension rod so the amount of opening is uh, varied when the di diaphragm deforms that is our uh, variable no area in the analogous to variable nozzle so uh, this distance is converted the because this is fixer nozzle this is variable nozzle in between these two nozzle we have called it chamber here so chamber pressure now that is chamber pressure is a function of the open amount of opening here so the amount of opening is given is nothing but our displacement in the extension rod uh, so that is proportional to the extension rod so d is converted into po by this flapper nozzle system this po is read by a pressure gauge and you got the signal here so this pressure gauge reading will be cal calibrated in terms of force we have applied so known force you can give and calibrate it by having dead weights or something like that later on the machine member will act um, on this and then uh, and then uh, unknown force can be for read from this pressure gauge which is calibrated in terms of tons or newtons whatever it is so these are the uh, two uh, principles under the hydraulic pneumatic principle next we are going to see elastic elements how elastic elements are you made use of in force measurement a typical elastic uh, elastic element is a uh, ordinary spring uh, helical helical spring this is helical spring we call we call it spring balance this is a spring balance domestically used spring can i mean normally used there so there you will have the hook and uh, here you hang your weight whatever weight you want to measure and uh, from the other end a pointer is taken this will be moving over a scale this is the scale only scale we see all the things are uh, covered by a uh, cylinder or a cover the this pointer mechanism will be inside so you see the outside of the pointer moves over in this over the scale so normally we may have up to 0 to 20 kilogram force this normal range domestic spring balance and with a least count of 0.5 kilogram uh, we can read up to 0.5 kilogram force this is a very uh, convenient to use uh, the uh, measure the uh, household articles household articles so this is the uh, the first uh, foremost elastic element that is the spring itself is made use of in the in the form of spring balance and uh, other elastic element is uh, the foremost and often used is the column type uh, column type string spring uh, column type strain gauge load cell this is very often made use of and it has got fairly high uh, load carrying uh, high uh, capacity so few tons up to few tons we can measure the, uh, the main advantage uh, of uh, all these instrumentation is this uh, spring balance is, uh, is a purely mechanical instrument uh, because only static no dynamic measurements can be made but in case of uh, this uh, column type strain gauge, uh, strain gauge load cell the we are converting the mechanical signal force into an electrical signal so you can use it for both the static as well as dynamic uh, measurement force can be varying and still you can measure it 
as you find this is typically a second order uh, second order instruments we have got a, a particular uh, uh, i mean uh, spring constants that uh, that is the uh, force uh, force per unit deflections so spring is there and air is the um, uh, surrounding medium damping medium and the mass here uh, will be the force transmitting element suppose this is being transmitted by a machine member that mass also we have to consider in in finding out the natural frequency of the whole instrumentations so the mass of the uh, uh, transducer alone uh, is not sufficient the transmitting uh, force transmitting member uh, that weight also we have to add to this uh, machine to this instrumentation uh, to this column so it's a typical second order instrument here what you are doing is um, uh, we take a, a length for a, suppose uh, this we are using for a compressive force um when you want to use it for tensile you uh, you have two cups or some whatever it is with a spring uh, with a screw threads you can uh, make suitable fittings and then apply a tensile force so same instrumentation you can use it for tensile force also same column here we have to you want to stick uh, strain gauges so uh, if it is sufficient uh, sufficient large diameter surface area we need not make the uh, flat surface you cannot make a square surface inside on the flat, uh, just on the um, on the cylindrical surface itself you can paste uh, strain gauges so this may be one the uh, two is uh, uh, perpendicular directions uh, this is two three is behind just to be diametrically behind this so in the so this is our three this is our strain gauge one strain gauge one and uh, this is two two because in transverse directions it is faced at 2 and 4 so 1 2 3 4 these are the that is if the um, uh, if the column is having if the cylinder has some sufficiently large surface then we can place the strain gauges on surface itself in, but uh, if it is a smaller diameter then uh, the curvature uh, may not allow us small curvature may not allow us to paste the strain gauge rigidly so in that case we make a square cross sections or uh, or flat surface we machine it and then paste the strain gauges for better bonding so it becomes after uh, fixing the strain gauges on the uh, column uh, then it becomes part of the uh, column and this column material you have to carefully select we should reduce the hysteresis effect of the spring material so some uh, alloyed steel or spring steel with uh, uh, some uh, additions will make uh, a long a large elastic limit as well as less hysteresis this is what is important for long uh, long time uh, for long time usage or long life the calibration should not change so once we, uh, we know for a column type we cannot paste all the strain gauges along the axis this we have learnt already under bridge network uh, uh, the uh, sensitivity of bridge network so two strain gauges along the axial directions that is the strain gauge uh, uh, loop will be along the axis in the other strain gauges it will be it will it is 90 degree perpendicular to the axial two in axial direction two strain gauges in transverse directions uh, that will make a 2 uh, into 1 plus mu where that is the total sensitivity of this instrumentation where mu is the poisson's ratio we learnt uh, at that time poisson's ratio where s is the sensitivity of a quarter bridge so with uh, such uh, instrumentation you will have the twice the suppose if it is 0.3 then you will find uh, 1.3 so 2.6 times the sensitivity of a uh, quarter bridge that will be total sensitivity since higher sensitivity means we can have larger signal output eo so now the four strain gauges are connected in the bridge network r1 r2 r3 uh, r4 so r1 r3 axial strain and r2 and r4 takes the transverse strain poisson strain so it's called poisson's configuration we have learnt already earlier so it should be like this if all of them in the axial direction output will be zero so to avoid it we put two in poisson's con two in uh, transverse directions and so now this instrumentation we find it is insensitive for the temperature variations because it's a full bridge all the four uh, four strain gauges are under the same temperature conditions so you find uh, uh, temperature compensation is already there yeah the, there is no dummy gauge there is no need for any dummy gauge so uh, temperature because all temperature uh, brings uh, effect same effect in all the strain gauges any same effect on all the strain gauges will give rise to zero output output we know already so temperature is taken care of uh, regarding the uh, in the, uh, the, uh, in the uh, 
coefficient of uh, linear expansion, that aspect of it. But temperature will affect the Young's modulus of this column material. Yeah? That is, uh, when, uh, when temperature is higher, then Young's modulus will come down. That is, for a given force, you may have larger deformations when Young's modulus comes down. Then that is to be accounted for, that is done by having a, uh, so, yeah, resistance in series with the excitations to the bridge. How this, uh, um, how this compensate for this uh, uh, change in Young's modulus? Suppose temperature has increased, then Young's modulus comes down, then large strain is there, so larger output voltage will be there in the bridge network. So this we want to reduce it, that is done by having RC in series, this also will be same atmospheric conditions, same temperature. So, when temperature increases, RC will increase. When RC increases, voltage drop here will increase. So, net voltage coming to the bridge will be reducing. We know the sensitivity of a bridge is proportional to the excitation voltage. When excitation voltage comes down, then the voltage output reduces. If you so select a value of RC, this reduction is equal to the increase due to the reduction in the Young's modulus. So, you will find more or less that uh, uh, net may be very small. If they are not equal, it may be very small. So, error may be within tolerable limit. So, that is the for temperature compensation uh, for, uh, for, young, for change in Young's modulus, we put a uh, yeah, resistance in series. And you will find one more advantage of this instrumentation is, this will be uh, sensitive only for this axial loading. Suppose there is a bending moment due to some eccentric loading, suppose it is here uh, and uh, you apply like this, so you find a small couple or moment is there. In such situation, what will happen? This uh, one will be suppose it tilt in this way, tilt in this way. So one will be in tension, and the three will be three is opposite phase. Three will be in compression. Now one and three they are subjected to opposite strains, and that means they should be put in adjustment terms for maximum sensitivity. But you find they are put in opposite terms. So opposite uh, strain in opposite terms gets nullified as per the rule of the bridge. So even if there is bending, there is no output due to that bending strain. Similarly, if this way, if it uh, eccentricity is there and 2 will be in tension, 4 will be in compression and 2 and 4 on opposite arms and opposite strain gives basically 0 output voltage. So, you will find this instrumentation is um, uh, insensitive for both bending load and temperature effects. So, that is advantage, but uh, one should be careful when we design this, uh, um, uh, this uh, column. Uh, column height should be sufficiently short so that under this compressive load, it does not buckle. That is one thing. Secondly, the place where we are going to fix the strain gauges should be uh, sufficiently weak or it should, um, uh, I mean, it should, it should sufficiently weak, okay, sufficiently weak to produce sufficient strain in the member. If we fix the strain gauges on the existing member which has been designed for strength, then you will find uh, the strain produced will be very small of uh, pi, uh, 0.1 or 0 0.2 micro strain which will not give rise to any output voltage. So, when you want to fix the strain gauges in existing member, there at that place you have to weaken it, so that uh, uh, there is sufficient strain, but you should not weaken in a way it goes to plastic region, but still the loading range should be just above the uh, elastic region. So, uh, it will produce at least say 200 micro strain, that is what we, uh, what we expect, microns, at least 200 micro strain should be there for the maximum loading. If it is 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 microns, then it will not produce any effect. So, you find uh, for this load cell where we want to fix the strain gauges, there, there should be sufficient strain. To that extent, you have to weaken that place and then only fix the strain gauges. This is what is important. So, here you find in the column type, the, um, uh, the um, uh, spring constant, since it is a um, solid member, is uh, uh, so, uh, fairly, fairly large. And um, uh, that is deformation will be very small very small to have some more sensitivity, but advantage is since K s is large and the omega n which is uh, k root of K s by m will be larger omega n. So, it will have naturally larger bandwidth, but the problem here is uh, since it is a column, it may have the uh, smaller deflections or sensitivity may be small. To increase sensitivity, what we can uh, see one disadvantage by when we reduce the cross section, then it becomes uh, too narrow here or uh, you may have very small area for the strain gauges. To avoid the problem, what, they, what people do, you can have a hollow, ho hollow constructions at the place where we want to fix the strain gauges, have the hollow constructions, small wall thickness, so inside it will be hollow. So that you find it is weak at same time sufficient area is there for fixing the strain gauges. 
So all these uh, uh, all these measures we can observe so that sufficient uh, sensitivity will it comes. But another better design is going for the proving ring transducer. Here we have much more uh, sensitivity than this, but uh, problem here is K S spring constant is reduced and bandwidth is reduced. So that this always the case in instrumentation when you want to increase one characteristic uh, value and some other characteristics gets affected. That is uh, why you have to come to a compromise. Anyhow, this uh, proving, proving ring load cell or transducer is widely used in uh, uh, pl places, industries and laboratories. It is made up of just you have a ring and the surface of the uh, inside and outside surface and uh, surfaces, we paste the four same gauges as it is shown here. And this is the end view of it. So you find when the load is applied, F, uh, the, it is compressed, the ring is compressed. So this uh, compressive load converted into um, uh, bending strains at the surfaces, 1 and 3 will be subjected to uh, uh, tensile strain, 2 and 4 will be subjected to co compressive strain. Then the same uh, uh, same bridge holds good, 1 and 3 in compressive, 2 and 4 in uh, tensile, uh, two, 1 and 3 tensile, 2 and 4 in compression. So, so some bridge we can use. Again, you can have this compensation for elastic uh, modulus change due to temperature. So, same circuit you can use it for this and also advantage is here more sensitivity and um, uh, but uh, the load capacity is reduced. So, if you wanna pr probably one or two ton. Here we may go up to say uh, for 50 or 100 tons we can go for column type. Here it is a small little bit reduced. The disadvantage of this setup is uh, if you uh, unknowingly load more then these points may go into plastic, uh, defo plastic uh, de uh, deformations it may not come back to original, we might exceed the elastic limit, that is danger. To avoid this, we have some other design. Yeah. Here is a load cell with uh, overload protection. See here, this special construction with a gap, yes. So the in one circle, we have got two circles with the central gap. So when you, give, when you put the load here, F, so and, uh, this is a fixed surface, when it is compressed, and uh, when the gap is reduced to zero, any further loading will go to the floor or the ground directly, it will not stress or strain the uh, elastic uh, member. So until uh, it becomes zero, you have got uh, strain here, it will be within the elastic limit. So you will find uh, beyond elastic limit, the force will go not through this element but directly to the floor through the uh, through this bulging. Yeah? So the, that is the protection, overload protection here. So if you want to have still smaller, uh, higher, still higher sensitivity and start, uh, smaller uh, for smaller load range, the natural cell is a few gram onwards we can measure by having the cantilever type of load cell. Yeah, I say it's written is cantilever transducer, but cantilever load cells. This we have made use of for expressing, for explaining many principles, bridge uh, network principles. We have used this example very often. So you find at the top surface uh, two strain gauges, one and three. Same uh, same bridge network, whatever you learnt earlier, same thing holds good. So this is one, two, this is three, four. That is one and three will be in uh, for this type of loading. It's uh, tensile strain. Two and four will be in compressive strains, and uh, four diff. I mean two polarity you have got. So all the four will give rise to four times sensitivity of a quarter bridge. So this is a full bridge, and temperature compensation is there. And uh, for uh, accounting for the Young's modular change due to temperature, we connect RC. Say same circuit, we can have it. So uh, this is for uh, smaller load range. We can go for this cantilever type. By having the different thickness uh, and a different length, we can have different uh, um, uh, load ranges in this. It's a very versatile, useful uh, principle. Uh, then next one is using diaphragm and uh, using LVDT, diaphragm type of uh, load cell. So two diaphragms are there. And uh, at the middle of the diaphragm, one uh, rod is connected. And at the end of the rod, we give the force which we want to measure. It is supported in the, say, it can be supported on the floor. Now give the load, and the, the, the diaphragm deforms like this. So this deformation is maximum at the middle. So the rod comes down. At the uh, bottom end of the rod, we connected the, we connected the core of a, of a LVDT or a, of a self inductance pickup. Here it is LVDT. So this is your uh, supply voltage, two secondary connected in oppositions. So the up, uh, output voltage EO is a modulated voltage, a modulated signal, modulated modulation between ES and the magnitude of the displacement of the core. 
and further we process it as we learnt earlier in uh, LVDT uh, by giving amplifying or uh, or without amplification given to phase sensitive demodulator and low pass filter and finally we get a displacement, uh, this displacement there. And that displacement is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, written in terms of Newton or this so many, so, yeah, yeah, uh, Newton or kilogram force. That is how the displacement reading is converted in, uh, is uh, calibrated in terms of a force unit. So here we have two transducer, one to transduce the force into deformation and this deformation back to uh, voltage, that voltage is written in terms of Newton. So two secondary, uh, two, two transducers in essence. Uh, that is the case in almost all the type what we are, the elastic members with uh, uh, strain gauges. Uh, we use uh, uh, one member, elastic member to transduce the force into strain. That is the block diagram. That is the force converted into strain. Yeah, force converted into strain, either in the cantilever or in the proving ring or in the load cell. We use that uh, primary. This is a primary transducer, load member. So uh, this is to be properly designed so that sufficient stress and strain is there. And then later on, we give this to a bridge network. That is our bridge network. Uh, bridge network. And from there we get an output voltage. This is the instrumentation. This output voltage is further amplified or uh, uh, read according to the situations. Yeah. So two transducers, more or less we will find true transducers are there. Epsilon, epsilon to Z, E0. Yeah. Either the LVDT or strain gauge, anything we can use. The one problem in the cantilever type of transducer is, suppo suppose this is load button, uh, lo this place where you are supposed to apply the load or force. If it is a little bit changed, you know, uh, it's a, a little bit changed, then you will find for the uh, for the same force, little bit earlier in this cantilever, you have the less strain here. Then the instrument will show a uh, less reading, smaller reading. The force may be 10 or 100 Newton, but the instrument will show only about 90 Newton. It is because it is shifted from its original place by some due to some error or something like that, L little bit earlier. So uh, to that extent, the instrumentation gives rise to uh, that is, it is very sensitive to the proper placing of the load on the instrumentation in the load cell. That problem is solved once you go for the shear type of load cell. Here you can apply it here or here, nothing will happen. It will give the same reading. It is uh, non-sensitive for the location of the load at the, more or less it is this loading point. So about the loading point, if you vary, it is it, not affecting the instrumentation where it is in cantilever type, it is very sensitive for this small error in putting the load, applying the load. How it is uh, non-sensitive? It is because this instrumentation based on shear type. We know the bending moment diagram for this cantilever is, it goes like this. From uh, tip is 0 bending moment and at the bottom is the, at the fix, near about fixed end, you have got the maximum bending moment. It varies linearly. Whereas shear force diagram for this uh, cantilever, uh, for the same cantilever, shear force diagram is rectangle. If you shear force diagram is rectangle. From this point to the up to the fixed point, shear force remains same. It is same as applied load. That means uh, shear force does not change with the distance of the application of the load. So that is the property of what is made so Load is applied here, yeah. And uh, we know shear force is same throughout. So you can sell it any place. But, uh, but here you have to be careful because from shear force, uh, we have to go for the maximum stress or strain, that is principal strain the compressive or tensile strain that is at 90, at 45 degrees to this axis of this one. So the, uh, if the one, then the other one at the back side, you can put uh, of 90 degree to these orientations. So that, that will be in dotted line I am drawing. So it will be like that. So if one is in tension uh, due to the shears, due to the shear, shearing in this axis, so compressive tensile will be available 40 degrees to this uh, one which we have learnt in machine design. So um, uh, one will be in tension and two will be in compression. Then you uh, connect, uh, so in the same bridge, one is in tension, this is tension, and the other two is in compression. So adjacent terms you connect, and if you want uh, four, three also, you can, uh, uh, one and three, in the same way you can have another parallel, another parallel, and uh, you can have four chain gauges also. This will be three, behind that, for 90 degree to that, it will be four, so that full uh, full bridge, if one and two alone, off bridge, we are what we are making use of. So that problem of loading uh, at exact place or if you make a, I mean in the, this is an instrumentation which is not sensitive for the loading point. So it is nowadays very often used, shear type load cell is often used. And the next what we are going to see is the three dimensional load cell. Suppose you have four CF acts in, in, in some random direction like this, 
these are random directions which a component which uh, fx, fy and fz along the three coordinate axis. This is three dimensional one. So, it is not vertical or horizontal or uh, x direction or y direction, so some random directions. So, for that we use a column like this. This column should be a little bit um, uh, uh, sturdy or a strong column because due to this application if it bends, it gives rise to a lot of error. So, the amount of deformations should be uh, limited. So for that, to that extent, you have to have a strong beam uh, fixed at the bottom end. Now, the Fx and Fy, they will bend the beam having a cantilever at the having fixed end at this bottom. The beam will uh, function as a cantilever for Fx and Fy. For Fz, it is again a column. We know instrumentation for bending. For bending, bending top surface 1 and 3 tension, bottom surface 2 and 4 compression. Similarly, if you consider Fx, Fx uh, when it is act this way, this layer will be under tension, the other layer will be bottom layer will be under compression. So, x1 and x3, x1 and x3 are in tension and O2 and O3, O2 and O4 are in compression, Car, uh, I mean x2 and x4 are compression. So, uh, I have drawn one, say, one um, uh, um, bridge network and I am supposed to draw three bridge networks, for one for x, another for y separately, another, but uh, uh, nomenclature will be more or less same, that is why I indicated here, but we should have three independent bridges one for x uh, instrumentation, x direction and another one for y instrumentation and another one for z instrumentation. Three uh, bridges you should uh, build for each component force and the this is EO, EOX, you will have EOX from the x bridge and uh, EOY from for the y bridge and EOZ for the z bridge. So, three different bridges, they are uh, added finally in algebraic fashion and the final output voltage will be proportional to F. So, algebraic addition of these three independent voltages from three bridges will be uh, proportionate to the final force, three dimensional force F. But uh, we should be uh, careful the instrumentation for X direction Fx should not be influenced by uh, Y direction force or the instrumentation, the strain gauges meant for Fo, measuring Fy should not be affected by the uh, Fx. That is possible only when you fix the strain gauges. So, uh, the, um, uh, about the neutral axis, symmetrical distance from the neutral axis. For example, you consider this phase A, B, C, D. This is the phase and the neutral axis more or less at the middle. So, you find the OE1 and the OE3 will be equidistant from the neutral axis. In that case, the error, uh, the, in that case you will find uh, the instrumentation for Y will not be affected by the uh, force, the other two forces. Uh, for example, you can see F Y, F Y, O E one, O E three, and the F X is this direction. So you find uh, this is above the neutral axis. O E one will be in tension, O E three will be in compression. O E and O E three should be in adjacent terms for F X, but O E and O E three are in opposite terms. O E one and O E three are opposite terms, so it gets cancelled out. Similarly, you can analyze in all the strain gauges. So Z one is at the middle, at the middle, and you will find top side will be in tension and bottom side of the uh, from the neutral axis compression within the same gauge itself uh, it gets cancelled out. So, instrumentation for one direction force will not be influenced by the other direction provided the strain gauges are fixed uh, symmetric about the neutral axis on each face. So, for Fx and Fy we have got uh, four strain gauges. Similarly, for Fz, Fz is column type. So, you cannot have all the four axial directions. So, here we have the four times uh, sensitivity for Fy and uh, Fx as uh, the quarter bridge, whereas for uh, Fz we have the 2.6 times the sensitivity of the quarter bridge because it is uh, the axial force. So, 2 in axial direction, 2 strain gauges, other 2 strain gauges should be transverse in Poisson's configuration. So, sensitivity for Z will be little small, it does not matter. We calibrate in terms of the, uh, we, go, we are going to add these forces and then later on we are going to calibrate. So, this is the way all the three components and finally, we add the output of individual bridges and get the signal proportional algebraic addition and get the signal proportional TF. Next, we see the uh, piezoelectric force transducer. We know the piezoelectric crystals and uh, they respond to dynamic loads. So, we can have this uh, piezoelectric crystal apply the load either I mean uh, give displacement signal or we can give force signal also. Displacement signal alone we cannot give without a force because the crystal will not deform. It has got very high spring constant. 
So we, we can, now we use it uh, for the uh, for measuring force. Supply the force, then it deforms. The deformation is change uh, is producing a charge, and that charge we take it to a, a charge amplifier. This can be taken to a charge amplifier. Charge amplifier and uh, just to the charge amplifier, and uh, the voltage output can be read there with the help of a voltmeter. Yeah. So instead of displacement, we can use it for force also. Known force give to give uh, calibrate the readings, and later on uh, allow the unknown force to act, and then you can uh, from the calibrated curve we can find the what is the force. As we know, this crystal can be used uh, only for um, um, only for the dynamic load. That omega being between say 3.04 over tau and 0.2 times uh, uh, 0.2 times omega n omega n. That is for 5 percent error. 5 plus or minus 5 percent error and also when size equal to 0 that is crystal works more or less uh, air damping air damping can be assumed 0. So, you will find for under these conditions the uh, bandwidth for this instrumentation is 0, 0 0.4 tau is the uh, time constant of the electrical circuit 3.04 over tau that is it functions like a simple capacitor transducer because fixed uh, this is a metallic plate metallic plate at the bottom uh, and the at the top. So, uh, this is a dielectric medium um, insulating material. So, it is a typical capacitor circuit. We already learned 5 percent error omega should be larger than this value 3.04 over tau and uh, considering second order system we, we have found out uh, it should be um, uh, less than 0.2 omega n for 5 percent error psi being 0 this all we have arrived already. So, this is the working range for this piezoelectric transducer. Otherwise, it is a very good uh, dynamic uh, measuring instruments, a force measuring instrument. Second or uh, next uh, method is force by acceleration measurement, force by acceleration measurement. That is a member is uh, there, this is a machine member and we are we want to find out what is the force acting on this member. So, we can connect a load cell and find the force, but in many instances it may not be possible to connect a, to bring a load cell here. So, people what they do they put uh, an accelerometer here. So, they will measure the acceleration A and now we know uh, force F is equal to if M is the mass, mass into acceleration. So, by measuring the acceleration and knowing the mass of the body of machine member on which the force is acting, we can find out the force, it is indirect way of measuring. So, by measuring the acceleration, we measure actually force, but what is the drawback in this? It will measure only the resultant force, suppose there is friction force, it is moving over your surface, suppose there is a friction force F f, the net force is F minus F f, now instead of F, it minus F f, F minus F f will be equal to M a, that means you should know the friction force, if you do not know the fr friction force you will be assuming that to be force, so that will be error. So, you are measuring a smaller force, but you will be calibrating as a bigger force. Suppose you have 10 Newton and here 1 Newton, then only 9 Newton alone uh, accelerate this uh, mass. So, accordingly acceleration will be smaller and that you will be writing it as 10 Newton because you do not know the for, uh, friction force. So, that is the error component. So, that means the uh, acceleration will be proportional to the net force or resultant force and you cannot uh, find out the component of the resultant uh, component uh, com the different forces constituting the uh, resultant force. So, the this instrumentation you can use it only when the uh, resultant force is uh, one or if there is another force that force amount should be known to avoid the error in the measurements. Drawback is the acceleration is a resultant of the is a result of the resultant force that is the point what you have to measure. The next uh, what you are going to measure is, is closed loop instrument, it is called electromagnetic balance, that is electromagnetic balance, what I written here electromagnetic balance. This is a closed loop instrument, yeah. it is a closed loop, closed loop instrument. So far what you have seen all these instrumentation earlier version whatever you have seen, they are all in open loop instrumentation but now it is a closed loop instrumentation that general uh, advantage whatever it is there in closed loop instrument it is here for this instrument also that means they have got higher accuracy higher accuracy say 0.1 percent accuracy you can get whereas in open loop we can get 1 or 2 percent accuracy alone we can get inaccuracy. 
So it is functionally like this. Force is uh, this is one of the versions. There are many versions. One of the versions of such uh, uh, instrument is we have got a lever at the end of which we apply a force F, and uh, the other end we have got these inductive pickups, and the uh, ta this is a force coil. Yeah, we can call it a force coil. This force coil are arranged. The functioning is like this. Uh, we can explain with the help of the signal flow diagram also. We apply a force F and at the end of a lever, this is a lever, so a moment is there. That moment uh, say M i, this is M b. There will be some force on the force coil that is acting at a distance, so there will be some M b. The resultant of these two uh, moments is M e. M e acts over this coil spring. This is a coil spring. So that moment is converted into angular rotation theta, that is theta. Yeah. This theta at a distance of another uh, distance we have got, we have got um, uh, a pickup pick up at the some other distance. So, theta times the distance will be displacement at this tip uh, that is this is the tip displacement inductive pickups for measuring displacement. So, uh, that much displacement will be sensed by this pickup and it is given to the carrier frequency amplifier the current will be flowing here i yeah, due to this current. This current is taken to the force coil. The force coil gives rise to a force bringing the lever back to its original positions. So, amount of four, amount of current required to bring it back it is a measure of the force. If force is larger, it will tilt more and it has to be brought back, uh, higher current will be going. So, the amount of force required in the coil to bring the uh, bring the lever back is a measure and the proportional to that force, you have got current flow in this system. So, you find a current flowing through that constant resistor R gives rise to a voltage drop U O. So, that is why it is taken here. So, I following uh, flowing through R gives rise to U O with this output signal and this I is taken to force coil to give the feedback moment. So, now E O read in the uh, read here in with the help of voltmeter can be calibrated in terms of force here. So, that is how the closed, closed, closed loop instrument is functioning. Any error any temperature rise under will not affect this instrumentation accuracy because the if a, if a coil resistance coil uh, spring constant is changed due to temperature the same coil resistance uh, that uh, same spring constant is valid for the feedback also. So, that uh, uh, softening of the spring will not because softened spring will require only a less force here in the coil also. So, you find it gets stabilized, this error source gets uh, nullified. So, that is how it is uh, having a larger accuracy. Yeah, we will close it on this. Yeah.